This video is brought to you by BTI Institute, a New Jersey leader in certification-based management training. So basically a little bit about uh, Nitin and I. Uh, well, I'm Bob, as you know, I've basically been part of uh, the PMI New Jersey chapter since 2012. And I was very lucky to meet Nitin uh, as part of the Agile LCI. And basically Nitin and I, we basically hit it off really well. And pretty much since I joined, I've been working with Nitin uh, ever since. And it's been a really fun journey. And we were doing these sessions prior to the monthly meetings. And what we found was people were really interested, but then it was limited to people that only came to the monthly meetings. So that's when we came up with this uh, virtual Agile discussion group. Uh, so pretty much that those, those are, are my, my alphabet soup. I'm one that would never believe that I have so many acronyms, but basically you need to just look at what you're interested in, learn about it, and, some, and you might end up getting a certification. That, that's like an added bonus, but it's really all about the learning. So Nitin, want to talk about you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bob. Uh, likewise, you know, it's been great uh, working with you. And um, I think of an XP, extreme programming practice of um, pair programming. And they said, you know, two heads are better than one. We bounce ideas off each other. Uh, we have different energy, you know. Sometimes people get bored of me, but I think that's rare. And sometimes people might get bored of Bob, you know, they tune in and out. Um, I worked uh, as an agile coach. I worked as a scrum master. I worked as a product owner. And I realized I was um, in the mindset of agility way, way back in 2001 before I even knew these words. And I believe other people have had similar experiences as well. Um, I too have the alphabet soup. Um, so between Bob and I, I think you're gonna get plenty of information if you want with you know certifying bodies, how to formalize this, your journeys, and so on. Work with a multitude of teams from startups to teams that have been established for a year or more to teams at a program level, different industries. And I'm sure some of you have seen me speak before and we'll have the virtual session as well. And if you click ahead, Bob, uh, you know, we're, we're two palindromes, you know. So Bob and Nitin, you can spell our name backwards. So two perspectives, one philosophy, that's what we say. Okay, so basically now we wanna talk about why uh, we wanna cover this topic. And throughout my journey in Agile, I've been working with Agile teams for over 10 years. And I've noticed that every organization, they wanted, you know, the, the executives get this whole idea of Agile and they say, okay, we're gonna be Agile now. But the question is, how do you do it? And, you know, what level of formality do you add to it? And that's pretty much why we wanna have this topic because if you're using Scrum, a Scrum Master is a critical component of, of Agile. And if you don't get a good Scrum Master, your team is gonna be in trouble unless they have prior experiences because the Scrum Master really owns the process. We're gonna be getting into that. Um, and so basically, you know, looking at it, what is the difference? And that's pretty much what we're gonna get into. I'm gonna be covering the Scrum Master role and then uh, Nitin's gonna be talking about the coaching role. And it's a very fuzzy distinction, but we're hoping that you're gonna end this session uh, with that information as far as how you can actually tell the difference and what their roles are. And then basically what kind of levels of experience and expertise does the Scrum Master have? And then what would the expertise of a Agile coach have? And basically, I don't know, you know, I guess you can ask yourself the question, does one size fit all? Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm hoping toward the end of the, I'm not gonna give the answer, but uh, I pretty much, you guys probably know what, what that answer is already but there's many different types of coaches out there and it really depends on what you're looking for. And then they, we're gonna get into a little bit on how you, would, how you would actually pick an Agile coach and then you know, next steps where you can go from here. And the other thing about being a member of the PMI New Jersey chapter is you can always reach out to us, uh, you know, just send us an email, uh, message us on LinkedIn and we'd like to help. Uh, I, I really enjoy my most fun part of working with Agile teams is helping them start up and helping them understand what it is to be Agile and then what it is to follow Scrum and, and do Scrum the right way. All right, so basically there's different levels of roles and skills. So this is a chart that came from the Agile Coaching Institute. I was very fortunate to attend a week long Agile Coaching Bootcamp 
uh, with Lisa Atkins, who actually wrote Coaching Agile Teams. And what this is showing is there's different types of uh, individuals involved. At the organization level, you have this concept called an enterprise coach. And these, these people, these coaches, mostly work with the executives, all right? And then you have uh, an agile coach that sits around the different teams. And now agile coach would be more of a, a team focused individual where they'd be working with uh, scrum masters. My approach when I coach uh, teams is I'll work a lot with the product owner and I'll work a lot with the scrum master. But as far as I'm concerned, I take a back seat as a coach where it's the scrum master and the product owner. And then you have what they call an agile team facilitator. And that's also known as a scrum master. So this pretty much shows how, you know, where they actually would layer into your organization. And so now uh, this is a very fun exercise that you can actually do in a room uh, where you can take blue tape. And if you've ever come to one of the Agile LCI booths, uh, you, you might've seen this set up where basically uh, what we're gonna be doing is filling this out. And so the very beginning is it all starts with a, an Agile Lean practitioner. And what that pretty much means is you really need to understand what it means to be agile and what it means to be lean. And if you don't have that understanding, you should stop because basically uh, that without that, you can't really be a scrum master, all right? And so I'm gonna be talking about you know, what the scrum master does. So pretty much the scrum master has the skill of facilitation and their job basically is to facilitate the five scrum events. And so that's, that's pretty much what the scrum master does. And so now if we look at Scrum, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, you've probably seen this before, so I'll, I'll go through it uh, relatively quickly. Uh, what we have is there's three roles, and those roles are the product owner, the team, which is also known as the development team, and the Scrum master. And that's the only roles that Scrum actually recognizes. So if you were to read the Scrum guide, uh, you wouldn't see a project manager role, you wouldn't see a manager role. Uh, all those are not really part of Scrum. And then basically there's five events. The first event, which pretty much sets, sets the stage as far as what the team's gonna be working on. This is called sprint planning. And you can usually tell if teams are really adopting Agile well, is if they have a sprint planning part one and a sprint planning part two event. Part one is basically with the business and the stakeholders where basically the product owner presents to the business, these are the things that we wanna do in this sprint. Uh, so then basically all those items are then just, uh, described. And then there's a part two to the meeting, which ends up where the team comes together and says, okay, the product owner wants these 20 things. And the team looks at, you know, how much work it is. And then they get to volunteer for the different items that they're going to be picking up, which end up uh, becoming part of the sprint backlog, which is an, an artifact. But we're talking about events right now. So we have uh, the daily standup. That's also known as the daily scrum meeting. Uh, the daily standup is an XP term. XP stands for extreme programming. And pretty much uh, from the sprint planning meeting, uh, the, the team creates the sprint backlog. And then the team will then go into a sprint. And this, and this sprint itself is considered an event as well. And what, what happens is the team members will meet for 15 minutes and they'll talk about what, the, you know, what they're working on, what they're gonna do today, what they did yesterday. And they're also gonna identify any impediments or blockers or things that are slowing them down. Uh, the final event uh, at the sprint is called the sprint review. And so what normally happens is after the sprint, the developers or the business users, it, you know, it's really depends on what the type of functionality uh, you're doing, it would actually be demonstrated to the business. And so this is basically where, the, where it's important that the feedback comes in from the business as far as what the team built. And that feedback then goes into the into another event called the sprint retrospective. And the whole idea behind Scrum is it's about inspecting and adapting, where basically you look at what you did and change to make it better. And so as a Scrum master, and you know, why am I showing you all this? Well, as a Scrum master, this is your job. Your job is to make sure Scrum work works right. You're the process owner. And the heavy facilitation uh, of Scrum is basically facilitating the pl sprint planning meeting event, facilitating you don't really facilitate the daily scrum. You just kind of make sure the team's following it correctly because this is a dev team meeting. You're facilitating the sprint review and you're also facilitating the retrospective. And if you have a, a, a highly skilled scrum master, you can get a lot out of those events. And then there's three artifacts. Uh, the one is the backlog and that's pretty much owned by the product owner where these are the kinds of things that 
the product owner thinks they want to build. Um, and then we get into the sprint backlog. And I used to get really confused between these two. The sprint backlog is really a subset of the product backlog. It's what the product owner said, okay, out of this 100 item product backlog, I want, to, I want the team to work on these 20 things. Then the team has a sprint planning meeting part two, and then they volunteer and they let the product owner know if they have capacity in order to do that or not. So that's, that's a very important artifact because that ultimately is what gets delivered to your customer. And then the final artifact is the finished work. And some people say you have to move it into production to be successful. That's not so. It's, it's recommended because if, if you think about it, the quicker you move things into production, the better off you're going to be because, again, you're introducing small changes. You're not waiting uh, for three months worth of work before you release it. You're putting maybe two or three weeks, weeks worth of work into production. So you're actually minimizing your risk. Some people will say by doing multiple, you know, frequent production releases, you're increasing risk. But if you do scrum right, you're really decreasing it. And so now this, this also came from uh, the Agile Coaching Institute. And what I like about this is it kind of shows in a picture, three roles, the product owner, the scrum master, and the team. And then they also uh, mentioned this, this agile manager role who basically, they're, they're outside of the circle. So they're not really part of scrum, but their job is to facilitate mastery. Uh, the scrum master's job is to protect the team autonomy and the uh, product owner's job is to protect, is, is to define the purpose of the team, give the team a purpose. And if you're familiar with Dan Pink's uh, intrinsic motivators, th these are those three things, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Okay, Nitin. All right. Thank you for that quick summary, Bob. So facilitation is key here. Um, so what are the other quadrants gonna tell us? What else is out there? So what's Bob gonna show us next? Ah, professional coaching. So we all hear of the term coaching, you know, maybe you're thinking of a soccer coach, football coach, sports coach, uh, is there a chess coach? Is there an academic coach? But what is true professional coaching? And this gets muddled by a lot of people as well. Um, true coaches keep a neutral stance, keep their clients interest at heart, ask powerful questions as techniques, and help people figure out what's next. And this is not your agenda. This is not teaching someone. This is not mentoring someone. This is really offering your presence to someone to say, hey, what next? The coach is also someone who can just reveal to people what's happening. And that's someone who's a little bit sensitive to you know, the pulse of the team, understand corporate culture, and really, give people the aha moments of, you know, consequences. So working at a, a bank, for example, might be a little different than working at a nonprofit. And what does that really mean? And working at one team at a bank compared to another team at the same bank, you could see something different there as well. So this is another quadrant where we can even do deep dives. What next, Bob? Mentoring. So PMI New Jersey also offers a mentorship program. Again, a lot of people in the workplace offer mentoring. A lot of people in schools and colleges and academia offer mentoring. But in the world of agility, what does it mean? Mentoring, and we'll have examples for this a little downstream as well, is where you might offer your experience, you might offer some scenarios, but you still have to stay a little neutral and help people understand that this may or may not help your immediate team or your needs, but there's something of a possibility. And again, we'll do some more deep dives over here. And the last thing is teaching. This is really the one-on-one, which Bob went over very quickly. If you're new in the world of agility or scrum or other agile practices, there are causes and effects that are going to be there. Things are going to have a domino effect. And they're going to look upon a scrum master typically say, hey, you know, what's this meeting about for an event? And why is it 15 minutes or less? What's a time box? What are all these terms? What's this lingo about? And it's very simple. This is just helping people speak the same lingo. 
this is a dance that a lot of scrum masters and coaches have to go between. Again, we'll have a few examples. And underneath this, so let's maybe pause here and ask that, you know, has anybody experienced mm -hmm. these, you know, these types of things? Like, are you, have you been on a scrum team? Have you, you know, seen your scrum master facilitate events? Have, had you, have you seen mentoring take place or teaching? Does anybody want to share experiences? You might be on mute. Hi, yeah, Bob. I've been yes, hi. Oh, I thought someone else was speaking. Hi, this is Tiffany. Um, so yeah, I'm new to Agile. I just went into a new role in uh, June of this year. And a lot of what you and Nitin have spoke about around um, Agile and the Scrum Master, I'm seeing a lot of that taking place. So um, we just had a release one on a product that we put out yesterday. And uh, again, a lot of what you were just talking about um, our scrum master on that project, um, I have seen him exercise a lot of those things, the scrum meetings, the daily standups and so forth. So it's connecting, like, I'm again, I'm new to it, but this is helpful because it's connecting what I'm experiencing. Thank you. Great, glad, glad to hear that. Any other comments from anybody? All right, well, we got feedback that uh, some people were saying that this is an agile discussion group. So what Nit and I are trying to do is allow it to be that. So, you know, the, what you could look at is the presentation kind of ho hopefully will generate the discussion. So uh, Nit and, uh, let's, let's move on. Sure. So again, we have three clearly defined roles in Scrum. And again, Bob and I talk a lot about Scrum also because it's still the most popular in the framework right now under the Agile umbrella. And then you have the Agile coach who again sits outside your immediate Scrum team and their focus is really something else. A true coach is really out there to help you and guide you and their hope should be that eventually they're not needed. And that might sound a little confusing to some because you're like, well, where do we go then amongst other things? Well, if you start to empower your scrum master, you start getting in the same cadence, you start seeing the same lingo, the agile coach can just move from one place to the other. But the agile coach is not there for the glory. You know, the, the message is important, not necessarily the messenger. So again, quick distinction, agile coach is outside of the immediate team. And in my approach, when I work with teams, I've, I've been doing that a lot recently at BNY Mellon, where I work. Uh, I work, I train the Scrum Master. What I find is a Scrum Master pretty much is a project manager. A lot of times they will end up, they will end up you know, wearing the Scrum Master hat. So I have to do a lot of, I guess, unlearning, uh, you know, basically uh, because they're used to, a, a typical project manager or program manager would be used to command and control. So a, a lot of that is I have to get, get them thinking in an agile mindset and in helping them understand the value of the different events and how to actually organize. We use JIRA, uh, you know, help them with that. Uh, I'll also work with the product owner, helping them understand how important the product backlog is. So like when I, when I coach, you know, my, my main focus is a lot of mentoring and training uh, because that's pretty much what teams really need to get started. And that's where, uh, you know, bringing in somebody that really knows what what they're doing, you can really help your organization really ramp up quickly rather than have people just kind of uh, like the Wild West come in and just kind of do you do do their own thing and think that they're actually being an agile and following Scrum. Yeah, great so comments, I, Bob. I got to echo the same thing. Sometimes an agile coach will wear another hat. So I was at a data center and they were just ramping up this new team, but they didn't have a Scrum Master, which was fine. So they said, hey, show us what it would look like. You know, what does a scrum master have to do? And I said, okay, well, let me be your scrum master for a while. And uh, the, the team thought they might have this one person take on that role, but given some three or four weeks, it's like, oh, I don't think I want to take on that role. 
But somebody else stepped ahead and said, uh-huh, I see what you're doing. I've been shadowing you for a little bit of time. And I take that on. And then I would take off my Scrum Master hat and then take something on and something else to do. Do I hear a quick comment in the background before we move on or a question? Yeah, I had a comment. Uh, this was when you're coming on a new team, I think, and they're, and they're new to, to Agile, at least my experience as a coach has been fear that you're there to see what they're doing wrong <laughs> and that somebody's going to get in trouble or somebody's going to lose their job <laughs> but you're you know but you got to explain to them that's not that's not your role you're not there to you know hurt them you're there to help and and try to you know um, guide them as a coach I mean so I, I just I don't know if you guys have felt yeah. that or have had that experience as well so oh yeah fear is real and you can Think of the acronym F-E-A-R in different ways as well. Um, anecdotally, you know, when I am with a new team, I ask a really weird question because I come in as an outsider and they don't know me, right? So I ask people, hey, how do you want to work with me? And there's typically silence in the room because it's such an unusual question that I kind of have to break it down. I said, okay, um, how about we get these sticky notes, some pens and just write one sentence on, you know, how you want to work with a stranger or an outsider, you know, you want maybe uh, keep it light, keep it humor, you know, or, you know, just getting a few words sprinkled here and there. And sure enough, they start writing stuff and I get some very interesting feedback. And this is an interesting exercise because I then say, well, now that you kind of know how you want to work with me, you know, with, you know, how it is, can you kind of figure out how do you want to work with each other as a team? And it's interesting because they go, some of the things I've got is help a brother out, you know, because that gives them a sense of comfort. That gives a sense of, you know, teamwork. You know, one guy wrote, hey, call it as it is for me as the coach, okay, because he wants to learn. He wants to be held to that higher standard. But yeah, we want to get these agreements in place. We want to get these norms. These are really unspoken until somebody kind of just reveals it. And that helps reduce some of the fear factor in, in what I've experienced. So you're really just trying to help. The other unfortunate thing is as soon as you make things transparent, some people start pointing fingers. It's like, oh, what about this, what about this? Well, the idea of transparency is to slow down a little bit to figure out what next. And we're not really looking for criticism. We're looking for perhaps constructive criticism, but how do we address certain scenarios or situations without getting punished by the powers higher above? So that's what a coach is going to help. You know, great, great yeah. response. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, I, I've ahead, experienced Bob. that a lot with, uh, I see that a lot with scrum masters where they're worried, like, oh no, that, you know, I'm going to be uncovered. And so what you have to do is really focus on that whole trust and letting them understand that, you know, we're not here to make you look bad. We just want to make you be a better scrum master. That's really what it's all about. Uh, so it, it's, it's very, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, you were talking about scenarios then. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, uh, just want to know, like, uh, can you elaborate on uh, coaching and uh, training? What's the... But looks let's do a few examples. We'll, we'll, you'll see a few examples, Chris, and hopefully, will become a little clearer. And then we'll also debrief towards the end if you want to, okay? Sure. Um, so here's a scenario, you know, it's, it's very common. Um, select members of the dev team are not meeting consistently for the daily scrum. That's your huddle, that's your checkpoint, that's your sync. And how do we deal with this? Now, they say there are two sides of a coin, but I always say there are many sides of a pyramid, right? So if I were to be in the teaching quadrant or took that stance, I would say, hey, you know, the purpose of this meeting every day is, and explain it that way. If I had a different stance of facilitation, I might just say, hey, you know, let me get the meetings together. Let me put something on the calendars and see how people can just help explain three questions. That's the facilitation stance. Mentoring could be, hey, something in the past. It could be with another team within this company. It could be with another company itself. 
And I'm bringing my experiences here, which may or may not, again, help this team or the situation. But it's just a thought process. And coaching really is more of the open-ended questions, particularly staying away from yes, no questions, is, hey, what does this team want to do when this happens? So here, I'm not imposing my beliefs. I'm not solutioning something. I'm really looking for a response from the collective intellect of the team that has formed. So it's very subtle. Depending on the situation, the scenario, the pulse of the team, I might dance between these four as a coach. Let's move on to another one, Bob. So a little bit on the coaching side. Again, take a neutral stance on the client's agenda. Stay present, put on your listening ears, see what it is that they're expecting, what it is that they're hoping for. And then just help unfold and reveal what is happening. Hey, some people are not really into this. Is it because they're coming for waterfall? Is it because they're busy? Is it because not everybody's aligned? Is there fear? What's happening? Just make it more explicit, whatever it is. And again, hopefully, as the team tackles on more, I will step away from this to have a more empowered, hyperproductive team. And again, make sure that your agile coach can talk about those four quadrants very clearly. And again, you're an outsider. That means, and this is a little subtle, a scrum master can tell me if I'm a coach, no, we're not doing that. And I'm like, what? Do I take it as a personal bruise to my ego? No, I could say, well, okay, tell me a little bit more so that I can just maybe raise a few questions, understand things a little bit better because the scrum master is even closer to the members of the dev team and the product owner. I am an outsider. If you truly have that empowered team, you're still gonna be making progress one way or the other. What next, Bob? Sure, and just to add on a little bit to uh, Chris's question, uh, usually what ends up happening is you're, you have a scrum master that starts really doing well. Then all of a sudden the scrum master is going to find themselves teaching because the scrum master really, when they come in, their, their base competency is facilitation. Their, their job basically is to facilitate the scrum events. But then as they grow, they start learning how to teach and they do that and they start teaching other people, other teams. And then they start even mentoring where basically, you know, other scrum masters might come to them asking for advice and they might end up mentoring. And then ultimately they become a coach, which basically is when you're not really telling people the answer, you're giving, you're giving them an opportunity to figure out the answer yourself by guiding them through a very uh, good conversation. So that's pretty much how it works. And like a lot of times you might get a little confused, like, you know, why is this scrum master mentoring? Why is this scrum master uh, teaching? And it could be because that scrum master is, is on their way up to become eventually to become a coach. Okay, Nitin. All right. So when we talk about coaching, let me take you away from the world of agility just for a little bit of time. There's something called Strengths Finder which I use extensively and teams love it, at least the teams I work with. This is a quick psychological assessment based on your strengths. This was done by Dr. Clifton uh, and Tom Roth. And you could do this just for yourself as a journey into self-awareness and aha, go run to your spouse and hey, look, this is what it's saying about me. Your spouse will just smile and say, yep, I already knew. Uh, I married a psychologist and I think she's part psychic as well. And this is something that you can map to a team as well. Well, what next? Uh, again, Dr. Clifton is no more, but Tom Roth, and they've had decades of research on this. And there's an actual book called Strengths Finder. And I actually handed it out to some developers out in India. I said, hey, I have a book that you don't have to read. And they looked at me, they were very confused. Like, what do you mean you're giving us this book but you're saying you don't have to read it. I said, yeah, because you know developers read so much, they hate reading extra stuff, they hate documentation. All you have to do is go to the last page, go online, put in this code, 
and sit in front of a screen for about 20 minutes and it's gonna ask you a few questions and tell you things about yourself. How cool is that, you know? And they say this can be used with people 10 years of age and above, you know? Not that we're in st- saying, hey, we wanna have child labor and all in agile teams, but <laughs> it's very popular amongst teenagers and kids at school as well. So what does this look like? There are, broadly speaking, a few categories that reveal certain traits about who you are. The idea is, you know, we spend a lot of times honing our skills and looking into where we could improve. But what if we found a way of really identifying our top five strengths and just revealing that and bringing that out to the forefront in a team? So here we have things such as execution, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. So what could some of these things be? So under execution, you could have an achiever, an arranger, belief. Um, Under relationship building, someone who's adaptable, someone who's connected, someone who has empathy, and someone who's an includer. Very generic words, we've all run through them. What you're seeing on screen is an actual readout of a team that I coached. There were six people on this team. And if you were to look, let's say team member one going left to right, their top skill was number one, achiever. The next one is under strategic thinking, two. Then they went into relationship building, three. And then four is also under relationship building and strategic thinking. But if you notice under influencing, they didn't have any strengths there, at least in the top five. Team member two, if you would follow left to right, they have three strengths under influencing and they have two under strategic thinking. That means while they might build relationships and they might be executioners, it's not their core strength. And similarly, something was revealed for other team members. So let's go ahead, next slide, Bob. And I simply asked, what if team member two stepped away or won the lottery for two weeks? And I'll likely pause for a moment, to go back just for a moment, Bob, and see if anybody can answer that quickly or just type it into the chat. Would it be that you would lose your influencer of the team? Exactly. So here it is. You've looked at a model very quickly. You're not an expert. I'm not an expert. You've got a quick intro and boom, there it is. The one person on this team who is capable of influencing other people is not there for a possible two weeks or a sprint. What would happen if they say, hey, we need this guy on um, another team? Not gonna happen. (laughs) Right. These are subtle things, not necessarily related to technical skills, anything with certifications, how long you've been there. This is really, you know, your psychological buildup. So as soon as this person goes away, the team actually agreed and they had this utopian Zen moment saying, oh my God, we we really do understand why we need this person and why this person is so important. But we also understand, you know, if they try to get this person away, what happens? So the team now is working even better uh, in protecting itself or when they're thinking of the future and they're looking to add someone on this team, they wanna have someone to at least have a little bit of influencing type skills or strengths. So let's move on, Bob. And we already covered this. So this is just bringing more awareness to the individual as well as the team. And this is not teaching, this is not facilitating, and this is not mentoring. Go ahead, Bob. It's really 
to me, something like that would really help the team because it, individually they could understand where their strengths are and how how important it is to be a team. I, that, that's such a cool picture that you should on that last slide. Yep. And then again, there's nothing specific about agility here. You could use this with any team setup. All right. Uh, now let's go on to the last part. We talked about the facilitator as the scrum master. And then I did mention that sometimes the scrum master may start teaching and mentoring as they start evolving and growing their skills to become the, uh, a coach. And then the coach basically means they can do everything. And again, the base is understanding what it means to be agile and understanding lean, because that's, that's the basis of how we work. And all Scrum is, is really just an enabler. And Scrum enables teams to be agile. Uh, Kanban enables teams to be agile. Uh, that's, that's pretty much what those frameworks are for, is to enablement. Now, when we move to the enterprise coach, there's three competencies that, that come online. Uh, there's transformation mastery, business mastery, and technical mastery. Now, depending on what's going on in the business, uh, like say you're a big organization and you're having problems with your uh, DevOps and your, you know, your, your deployments aren't clean and you, you need somebody that's really a technical understanding, understands Git, understands Sonar, understands all those technical tools that can help teams, help, help teams get uh, continuous integration. That's when you bring in an enterprise coach that has te technical mastery. Now, if you have uh, a business problem you're trying to solve, you'd bring in somebody with business mastery. And that, that would be somebody that would be able to help the business come up, uh, redefine their processes and make them work more efficiently. And then the ultimate thing is a lot of times an organization says, oh, that, I want to do an agile transformation. And then that's a transformation mastery. And now it's usually one person doesn't do all three. It, this would usually come with three separate enterprise coaches that the organization would bring in, uh, depending on you know, what it is, what they're, what they're trying to do. Uh, and a lot of times the technical side of it, uh, the technical person would be uh, you know, more on the side of technology and really understanding and really helping the organization get, get their uh, infrastructure set up correctly to support agility. And so, uh, how would you pick an Agile coach? Nathan, you want to take a try at that? Yeah. So go ahead with the bullets, Bob. So the usual, you know, someone who knows the industry, who's worked in the domain you're working with, so you're familiar with multiple Agile practices, because it's not all Scrum. People use Kanban. They borrow from extreme programming. They use Lean. They've rolled up their sleeves and hey, this is someone you can afford at that given moment of time. But given something a little bit more situational, which is the next set of bullets, um, someone who can work with individuals, teams, and the enterprise. So they've got a breadth. They can really come down one-on-one -on -one working with someone, coming up to a team dynamic, like we showed Strength Finders as an example. And the enterprise would be leadership. And so this is where we get into team coaches versus enterprise coaches. So a couple of years ago in the industry, we had something called the Certified Scrum Coach with the Scrum Alliance or CSC acronym. And that evolved. They said, you know, firstly, we shot ourselves in the foot. We said Certified Scrum Coach, but it's really an adult coach. And the other thing is we have different types of coaches. We have coaches that work at a team level and we have coaches that work at an enterprise level with different stakeholders. So as people started understanding that, they had different certifications in that area as well. So know your situation. Do you need someone to start off with one team? Do you have a multitude of teams, perhaps at a team level, or are you trying to do a full-scale enterprise transformation? So the higher standard, and this is someone who's simply going to help reveal what's going on and is a change agent. And they talk about change agents as, you know, two chemicals when they mix together, they kind of blend in. You know, they, they're, they recognize there's something there in that change and it just becomes one. And you want to have people in that mindset, that philosophy of, hey, why are we doing this? Why are we working this way? 
you know, people are fearful of change. And what could be some of the consequences? That gets a little bit into empowering. And in the next set of bullets, as Bob will bring up, is getting into your team agreements, you um, formulating some norms and navigating through conflict. Your true scrum master should have these three competencies. I would say that. Find a way of, be it an Excel spreadsheet, a whiteboard, an electronic thing. How does the team wanna to work together? What are the agreements? How do we work in certain scenarios? And what do we do when there's conflict or disagreement? The sooner you can get to these three, you're gonna save yourself a lot of headache, a lot of heartache when you're down. And is this still death do us part? <laughs> no, not necessarily. We wanna just help with either the initial adoption or sustain the transformation. Uh, a lot of people just wanna do an experiment, start off small, and you may not realize you're just chipping away at the tip of the iceberg or it could be something else. Okay. Does one size fit all? This, yeah, is tell us about this is the question that we all had at the beginning. Does one size fit all? So what does everybody think based on what Nate and I just shared with you? Of course not. There's no one size fits all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for being brave. Not, the situation. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Yes, that that's the, that's basically the, the the take. There's uh, again, when you're doing your interviewing, you just have to understand what the type of personality that you're looking for, what would work good in your organization. So a lot of that uh, has to do with you know picking the right person. Uh, I worked for the world's largest nonprofit a while back uh, called Teach for America. And the interview process lasted four months it, because they had to make sure that I would fit within that nonprofit culture. And it, that's, that's what it's really all about. And so uh, this, this last part, we're pretty much, we, uh, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but as you can see, you have this, this coaching framework, and you've, if you've come to an Agile LCI booth during one of the conferences, when we used to be all together in person, you, you might have seen this on the floor, where basically you have the different enterprise masteries and then the four stances of a scrum master or the coach, which sits with uh, the, uh, the lean and agile, basically based knowledge that you really must have in order to even be in this space. And now this, this here is uh, integral agile, it's basically, uh, it's another way of actually looking at how teams are doing, how teams are performing. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on this. So I'm just gonna really go through it real quickly where basically uh, Integral Agile has a set of questions where you can actually look at uh, the psychology of the team. And that kind of falls within this touching the lean practitioner and the professional coaching. Uh, the other thing that comes in is behavior. Uh, and that touches on mentoring and the lean practitioner. The other questions are cultural uh, and that touches on transformation mastery and facilitation and a little bit of business. And then finally uh, systems and that's the it's uh, module. And this whole thing is, was developed by Lisa Atkins. And it's just another way of seeing how a team is doing and how a team is uh, you know, performing and, and, and how, and it helps you identify things that you could change to make it so that uh, the team does better. Because again, safety is, is key. Uh, people have to feel safe in order to want to take risks. Uh, they also need systems that work. Like right now we're dealing with uh, remote workers in India who have really bad bandwidth and to get their machine started, sometimes they'll spend an hour and a half. Now, don't you think that that would be a negative uh, as far as uh, supporting an agile team? Uh, so it, it's, it's just a very interesting thing. And it's, that's what's so exciting about this space because it just goes on. You can just, it can, you can branch off into whatever area you're interested in. Uh, so now. What they did is they moved things around and they didn't want to touch their uh, original uh, Thing that they had published. So that's pretty much how everything now sits. All right, so to summarize, 
hopefully you found the different competencies between a scrum master and a coach. Uh, and it's all organizational specific. It's industry specific as far as what you particularly need. Uh, there is not one size fit all. And basically here's some additional resources. Uh, you might wanna to touch on some of these. Yeah, sure. So if you were to take a deeper dive into what professional coaching is in that quadrant, um, there's an organization, um, um, CRR Goldman, they go by Organization and Systems, Relationship Systems Coaching, or ORSC. And the idea is very interesting, and this was fascinating to me. They only coach on pairs or triads or quads or more. This is not coaching one-on-one -on -one because the philosophy is we're all connected to at least one person or more. And if we were to bring this into an agile team, such as a scrum team, your team doesn't consist of one person. It consists of two or more people. So how do you coach an entity or a system? Because let's say you're coaching this one person, they go home, how they are at their home, and they might have a significant other or not, they might have kids or not, that itself is a different relationship or a different entity. And if that person comes back the next day to their team, similarly, all the other team members had disbanded for a while and they've come back. So there's a very interesting dynamic when it comes to professional coaching in groups. And this will tell you a lot more about it should you want to explore the courses and classwork. Again, it's just for pairs or groups. It's not for one-on-one. -on -one. If you ever find any Scrum Masters interested in this or have such a thing, you probably want to grab onto them. So we'll pause. Let's see, Swap, were you going to bring out a... Uh, not, we don't have time because I, I want to give some time for Q and A at the end. And then th this is something that, um, it's a very great way. Like if you're having a meeting and you want to find out how you're doing, uh, you can basically say, Hey, let's do a fist of five. And basically one, if they put up one trigger, meaning everything's, uh, not so great. And if they put up five, everything's fantastic. And it's really great because like within one or two minutes, you can get the pulse of your room. So like if you're having a meeting and you're talking about something and you wanna maybe get feedback about yourself, you can say, hey, how am I doing? Let's do a fist of five. And you go one, two, three vote and people put up their hand and basically you don't record individual votes. You just look across the room and say, okay, I'm seeing like an average of three and four or four and five. And then basically then you move forward and that, that gives you the feedback. And then if you're seeing a lot of ones, you can take a step back and say, hey guys, okay, what's, what's, what's causing these ones? What can we change? And that's the whole idea where you're inspecting and adapting. So you should, even when you're having a meeting, you can still fix it. If, if you do this fist of five in the middle and, and things aren't going great, you can turn things around. It's, it's a great way to get feedback. And I'm gonna very quickly just supplement what Bob said with two added techniques to this fist of five. Um, I'm a facilitator, but if I wanna kind of do a safety check, I said, okay, everybody close your eyes and then quickly do a fist of five so that nobody in the room knows how everybody else voted for the feedback. Or if you wanna give the, the room or the team or the group a sense of how things are, maybe it's about you, the coach. The coach can actually take a U-turn, look away or step out of the room, everybody do a quick fist of five. And then the coach is invited back in or asked to open their eyes. So there are a lot of techniques you can add on to this. Back to you, Bob. And so uh, today's claim code, and when you get the survey from John, uh, is that it's showing on the screen, uh, C0202Q uh, as in quick, 9T as in Tom, B as in Bob, and R as in Robert. Uh, and basically that will be your claim code that you can use to get uh, PDUs. And so now quickly, I just want to, is there any questions? Um, I have a quick question regarding the class. Um, I registered for it when it first um, was uh, presented. Am I able to apply that discount code now after the fact? So you are, when, when you registered, you registered at the, uh, 
at the early bird price at at what what this is doing is it's offering thirty nine dollars off of, of eight ninety nine. That that's what that's so that's what the discount is. So if you registered at the eight ninety nine price, you could apply it, but that's that was how we that that's how we we structured it. All right, so I'll I'll need to look at what I paid because I I'm registered almost as soon as it was first announced and at the uh, member price. Okay, so you probably you probably ended up paying eight forty nine. Okay, I think so. Can you provide that discount code for the class again? Uh, sure, it's uh, all lowercase ADG for Agile Discussion Group and then CSM for Certified Scrum Master. And it's all lowercase. Hey, and we're going to be. Rocco. And we're going to be. Question. Sure, I just want to say one more thing. This, this discount code will be available through uh, November 7th. So you have, a, a, you know, a, almost a couple of weeks to use it if you want to. What, what was your question? Yeah, sorry, I cut you off. Um, you guys touched a little bit about retrospective. So we've had some, but nobody really speaks up. <laughs> How, do you have any good techniques for really getting some feedback from people, getting them to open up and sharing? Yes, there's there's a, a lot of good techniques that we're not gonna be able to share like in, in the last three minutes. Uh, but doing it remotely, uh, what you can do is if you come up with your format. Like if you, if you want to follow the scrum guide, and I, I don't always use that, this format, but it's basically uh, what should we stop doing? What should we keep doing? Uh, and what should we not be doing? You know, start, 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 stop, and continue. That's, like, that's the basic format. And so what you could do with your group is just go through the order and then create a table and have them one by one say stop start continue and basically give and just have those bullets on the, on the retrospective and then that that would be a way where everybody has to actually participate uh, but there's a there's a lot of other ideas that are more fun and more interesting but uh, you know real quickly that that's what comes to mind if you would like you know you can reach out to me you know after the meeting I, I'd be glad to share more topics and maybe maybe a future ADD a uh, agile discussion group topic could be retrospectives because there's so many different things you can do. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do retrospectives. Uh, I'm just, I'm assuming this is all virtual right now. Um, unless some people are going into the office. I would do a few safety checks just to get a sense of, you know, the pulse of the team. So I put something in the chat. I use something called the plot check wheel, which is just a very colorful diagram of like a flower about, hey, what are we feeling? And it's just a reflection. Hey, how do you think the last two weeks went? Or how do you think the last sprint went? And everybody just gets a turn round robin and they also have an option to pass, but the idea is to just be inclusive and give opportunity for people to speak. So start with that, just to get, get a sense of where people are at and then yeah, um, silent writing is another good exercise that I've used in case people are feeling shy. So they use these sticky note pads and throw them on the wall. But if you have a tool such as um, Trello, um, they can start putting it in. You also have to understand that the retrospective is one of the most protected events in Scrum. So I'm just curious to know like who's in it? Is it just your members of the dev team, your product owner and the Scrum master possibly facilitating? Or are they, you know, managers of the team members or are they leadership people? Because um, that will have a different dynamic to it as well. So make sure you just have the core of the people because it's not meant to be like the, the typical command and control, as we say, but more of a collaborative thing of trying to extract things out. So a, a lot of ideas with just a little bit of information you gave, but feel free to elaborate or just reach out to bother me or Somebody else has got questions. We can keep talking. Okay, we're at, we're at the top of the hour, and 